Hi, welcome to Dialed In. I'm Alex Cologne, this is Sasha Segan, and this is PC Mag's weekly, well, sometimes weekly show about Occasional mobile phones show. and technology. Uh, yeah, I don't want to start on the show with a false promise. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some pretty cool news stories. Uh, we're going to be, especially this great story that Sasha just wrote. Um, we're going to play some fun audio clips for you in just a few moments. Uh, we are going to discuss some of the latest rumors. If you have questions about any of the things that we're talking about, please leave a comment. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, uh, social people will read out your comment to us and we'll do our best to answer it. If you're watching this later on YouTube, please like and subscribe uh, to the PC Mag channel. So let's start with this fun story that you wrote at the yeah. end of last week. Um, you were working on it for a while. And um, so the name of the show is Dialed In. We talk about phones a lot. But usually what we talk about are things like cameras and processors and you know Android and iOS. And we don't often talk about phone calls. Yeah, and a lot of our readers actually ask me pretty frequently about phone call quality. And it turns out that a lot of people who are, who are more techie say, well, who makes phone calls? Well, uh, in 2016, Americans made 2.75 trillion minutes of wireless phone calls. Right. But the thing is, that amount has remained flat for about 10 years. That's not the growing area of device usage. Mm -hmm. And so it's an area where uh, the, you could say that the, uh, the, the, the marketing arms of the carriers and the phone manufacturers haven't paid a lot of attention, although the technology has been getting better. That said, a lot of people have complaints about their call quality, and a big part of the story was breaking down what some of those complaints are and finally figuring out definitively why they're happening. So, what you did was you looked into call quality, like how, how, why it sounds the way it sounds, how it can get better, um, how it sounds on different carriers. Mm -hmm. So what is the main idea? What, what makes call quality uh, either good or bad, and how can it improve? So what generally makes call quality better um, on one device or in one place than another is a good codec on a good connection. And the codec is the uh, way you encode voice. It's the way you turn the analog into digital. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of different ones that are used in the cellular industry. And they're used on different networks and on different phones. And some of them are better than others. And that has to be paired with a strong connection, a phone with a strong radio. Mm -hmm. Or you'll start hearing the kinds of dropouts and computeriness that come from errors on the network. Mm -hmm. Now there's one other kind of wild card that I think a lot of people don't know about, which is that the uh, connections between the carriers and between the carriers and uh, various providers of landlines often essentially have a gap in them, where even if your call quality is very good within your carrier, um, as soon as you try to go to a different carrier, they don't have their system set up to transmit high quality calls between each other, so the call quality drops down to a much lower quality uh, as you go over that gap between carriers. All right, so there's a lot going on here. Uh, you need the right codec. Right. You need good reception. Right. And you need to be going between carriers who essentially like each other. Right. So, in order to suss this all out, you made a number of different phone calls. Yes. Uh, you made phone calls from each carrier to every other carrier. And from each kind of network, 2G, 3G, 4G, to each other kind of network, 2G, 3G, 4G, because that affects your call quality mm -hmm. too. So what I was actually surprised about when I was editing your story is just how distinct the differences in call quality are. It really is. So let's play some of those audio clips. Yeah. So the best call quality you can get in the US today is on a 4G LTE network on a phone that uses the EVS, or Enhanced Voice Services codec. And uh, that is used for, uh, that is used on uh, uh, a limited set of flagship phones on Verizon and T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. And on T-Mobile, it only works for T-Mobile to T-Mobile calls. On Verizon, that particular codec only works for Verizon to Verizon calls. And let me show you how good that sounds. Hi, this is Sasha Segan from PCMag.com. This is a T-Mobile to T-Mobile call between a Galaxy S9 and a Galaxy S8. 
voice call quality can vary even on the same carrier depending on what phone you use. So this is a quick call to show you some of the differences. Find out more. So okay, so that's very, very precise, mm -hmm. right? Now, the next step down, because now not everybody has an EVS phone, right? but a lot of people have phones capable of HD voice. Mm -hmm. And HD voice is the next step down. It's uh, what you get when you call uh, within a carrier on its 4G network, right. or uh, within Sprint on almost any, uh, on any network. And let me show you what HD voice sounds like. Uh, for instance, uh, on AT&T. Hi, this is Sasha Segan from PCMag.com. The outbound carrier is AT&T, and the receiving carrier is also AT&T. Voice call quality can vary sharply depending on carrier interoperability, so this is a quick call to show you some of the differences. Find out more at PCMag.com. So that sounds pretty good. Like, mm -hmm. it's not quite as precise as that EVS call. Right. You know, it's not, you don't, you don't quite have as much of the sounds and overtones, but it's still pretty good. But now watch what happens if I'm trying to call from, say, AT&T to Sprint. Mm -hmm. Come on. Hi, this is Sasha Segan from PCMag.com. The outbound carrier is AT&T and the receiving carrier is Sprint. Voice call quality can vary sharply depending on carrier interoperability, so this is a quick call to show you some of the differences. Find out more at PCMag.com. And now, of course, that sounds like it's at the bottom of a well. Oh, yeah. And that's because between AT&T and Sprint don't have HD voice interoperability, so the quality of the call drops to what's called narrowband. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the story, you can see what calls sound like between the different carriers, between the carriers' different networks, uh, for instance, on T-Mobile. So we played that really, really high quality T-Mobile to T-Mobile call, right, with EVS? Right. But let's say you're both on T-Mobile, but one person on the call has an old 2G flip phone. Hi, this is Sasha Segan from PCMag.com. This is a T-Mobile to T-Mobile call using the 2G network between a Nexus 6P and a Galaxy S8. Voice call quality can vary even on the same carrier depending on what phone and... Not nearly as good as the other call. No. Yeah. So um, what I'm wondering is, is there a way to make voice quality better using your existing phone? Using your existing phone? Well, um, First of all, you need to check your settings. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be using Voice over LTE if it's an option mm -hmm. and if you're not doing it. Um, often that can be called advanced calling uh, on some carriers. Uh, you need to not be using Wi-Fi calling mm -hmm. because there's no quality of service <laughs> on Wi-Fi and so those calls tend to wobble. And uh, if you are calling very frequently cross carrier and you're dissatisfied with the call quality that the two carriers provide, you might want to use an over-the-top calling application, mm -hmm. like make your call through uh, FaceTime audio okay. on iPhones, or uh, Google Hangouts, or Skype, um, or WhatsApp, right. all of which use a codec that's equivalent <coughs> to uh, HD voice. Mm -hmm. And so are the carriers now, voice calling has been getting better. Uh, is it going to improve over time, or have carriers, are they just kind of going to leave it where it is? So uh, the carriers said to me that they are hoping to have HD, uh, HD interoperability mm -hmm. by the end of this year. Okay. So hopefully by the end of 2018, mm -hmm. we're going to see uh, calls between the four carriers in the US rise up to HD levels. Um, as for EVS, which is that new highest quality uh, codec, uh, Verizon and T-Mobile uh, are including it on more phones as time goes on. Mm -hmm. um, it still only works if you have an EVS phone to an EVS phone, right. but that'll be on more phones as time goes on, and then uh, then more people will be getting higher quality calls. So um, basically, voice calling will just continue to get better. Yeah, it's going to get better. Um, but if you're frustrated with it, and I think this this was the thing I was happiest about happiest with about the story. Mm -hmm. It, it was really about explaining why you're frustrated. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there who are frustrated, and this can at least help you figure out at 
what point that frustration happens. Mm -hmm. And that'll make you feel at least a little better and like you're a little more in control. Right, and um, so all the points that Sasha just made, um, how you can possibly make your voice call sound better, uh, he really goes into them in detail in the story. So if you go to our site and you check it out, first of all, you can listen to all the audio clips, which are pretty fun to listen to. Um, and you can figure out exactly how to tune the settings on your phone to make sure that you're getting the best voice calls uh, before hopefully um, they sound better by the end of the year anyway. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, let's talk about a new phone that's coming out in a couple of weeks that I can guarantee you, by the way, will have the EVS voice codec. Okay, um, and I believe that phone is the LG G7 Thin Q. And here it is, uh, <laughs> according to Evan Blast, champion leaker of the universe. Um, so, so the LG G7 Thin Q, which has, could we say it's in the top five of worst names? Um... Sure. I mean, you know, we should probably list them out, but uh what? Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely like if if I if I if I so if I go to worst names of phones ever, right. Um I would say there's the uh HP Glisten. That was always a bad one. Uh there was I don't know if you remember the uh Samsung colon close parentheses, which was supposed to be a smiley emoji. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the famous Samsung Galaxy S2, comma, Epic 4G Touch. Well, the, uh, the LG G7 Thin Q uh, looks like this, and this is a notch, but notice they have some software here to black out the area around the notch, mm -hmm. so at least it doesn't, you, you don't have the horn problem. Right. The thing that jumps out at me, of course, here is that. When's the last time we saw that on a flagship LG phone? That's true, yeah. So are they bringing it back around? I don't know. I mean, this this uh, press image seems to imply that the power button is going to be on the side now. That is how we're living now. Maybe it's not a power button. <sighs> Maybe it's the thin Q button. <laughs> Maybe it's like Bixby. <laughs> it's LG's Bixby. It could be. Oh man. Okay, so the 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 LG G7 thin Q is coming out on May second. We have that confirmed. We will be at the launch event. Um, it is rumored to have a 6.1 inch touchscreen, Snapdragon 845 processor, 4 gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of storage, um, and uh, that will probably be an uh, LCD screen. Um, so I am curious though, if they are indeed moving the power button back to the side. I mean, how many years has it been since they moved it around to the back of the phone? I feel like it was the G2, mm -hmm. so, wasn't it? Yeah, so like, Four, four years or so. Right. Uh, how do you feel about the, the rear power button? Is that something that you enjoyed? Or you just didn't care one, one way or the other? It didn't really bother me. I mean, I like the, I like the position of the re rear fingerprint sensor. I find that my, my finger falls on it easily. It's a much smarter position than Samsung has done with their various fingerprint sensors over the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely di let them differentiate a little. It let them play a little around with the bezel. Um, so I don't know why they're moving it to the side except Unless they're doing something really dramatic with the camera on the back, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that could be interesting. And so I do wonder if something like that's going to happen, because looking at these rumored specs that we have here, um, you know, it sounds like a nice high-end phone, but nothing is really standing out to me. Yeah, yeah, the ThinQ thing, uh, much as we mock it, so when we were looking at the LG V30 S Plus ThinQ, oh, that might be an even worse name. Well, this would still be top five, though, because yeah. you only three others. Yeah, excellent point. Um, so when we were looking at the V30S Plus ThinQ, uh, ThinQ refers to some sort of AI camera functions, mm -hmm. like auto scene detection and this uh, pixel binning function they have for super low light. And so uh, maybe they are, and, and it does feel like this year, manufacturers are pouring a lot into the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, the Huawei P20 Pro with the 40 megapixels. Yeah. Uh, the next phone we're going to get to in the show also has a big camera deal. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe they are holding back a big reveal on the camera. Uh, well, we're going to hear about this soon enough. So let's mm -hmm. get to the next one you just mentioned. Well, let's get to some questions. Oh, actually. Okay. Do you think that LG would ever go back to modular phones? Because what is it, the LG G5? G5. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the G5 was modular and it was such a failure. I mean it, it wasn't it wasn't a horrendous failure in terms of sales. It just kind of puttered along in terms of sales, but nobody picked up their modular torch. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with modular devices. Um, only, I feel like only Apple is powerful enough to create a third-party ecosystem around their device. 
And so any other manufacturer that um, creates a, a third party, uh, tries to create a third party ecosystem is really going to struggle with third party participation. I mean, I think Motorola has found that with the, with the Moto Mods and they've been super committed to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you agree? Do you feel that, uh, that uh, modular is kind of, modular kind of can't work out in the Android world? Um, I mean, based on what we've seen so far, yeah. I mean, Motorola is the most recent manufacturer to do it. Um, and I feel like they're definitely losing steam on the, on the Moto mods. Yeah, it's just no individual Android manufacturer can get the kind of third-party uh, third ecosystem rolling to be able to support a modular world. Yeah. So, um, should we get to the next phone? Yeah, so the Sony XZ2 Premium. Sony XZ2 Premium, such a Sony announcement. We are going to announce this super high-end phone. We will not tell you how much it costs. We will not even tell you when it's coming out, but we want you to know that Sony phones have really big features. Uh, so, I mean, we do know that it's coming out this summer, at least. Yeah, that's what they say, <laughs> yeah. Um, I can imagine it'll probably be expensive, but why will it be so expensive? It will be expensive because they have taken the <laughs> XZ2 body and they have put truly high-end specs in it. It's a 4K display with HDR up mm -hmm. from 1080p. Um, they're uh, six gigs of RAM, a 3540 battery, Snapdragon 845, that's like the XC2. But right. apparently the big deal here is that we have these, I'm trying to get a shot of the back, here we go. These dual 19 and 12 megapixel cameras on mm -hmm. the back with low light performance, supposedly up to ISO, 51,200, mm -hmm. um, which really means, I mean, when I was uh, water resistant, that's nice. Um, I mean, when I was growing up, I remember there was a big deal around Sony's like night vision video cameras. Right. You know, and I feel like, is this a night vision phone? <laughs> ISO 51,200? And yeah, what is that tagline there? Reveal the unseen. Exactly, exactly. They, taking photos in extreme low light conditions is made possible, and that's an ISO 12,800 on video. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really wonder, are they going to deliver on this super duper low light performance? Uh, and sort of like we were just saying with LG, it seems like this is the point that we've reached now where manufacturers are differentiating themselves with the camera more so than any other feature. 2018 really is starting to feel like the year of, uh, the year of camera intensity. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the S9, the camera was definitely a big, uh, a big part of the message right. on the S9. Um, of course, it over sharpens, but it was a big part of the message. Uh, the Huawei P20, definitely camera oriented. Mm -hmm. These two, definitely camera oriented. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is it that, Everybody's just gotten so stuck in terms of form factor, display, radio, that the camera is just where companies feel they can differentiate. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seemed like AR was happening for a minute. Yeah, it really did. It seemed like AR was gonna happen, and then it went back underground, and now we're talking about cameras. Right. Yeah. So what's up with AR? I. Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I we'll exactly. wait for the cameras later this fall to see if that's something that's coming back. Yeah, iOS 11.3 has some new AR features in it. Uh, I, I saw them when I was testing the new iPads, but once again, even on the Apple platform, which is the most vibrant AR platform, we are not seeing a lot of AR activity. Right. Yeah. So, cameras, 2018, that's what you're buying. Let's take another question. Do you feel like the uh, camera is ends up really being the main reason someone buys a phone? Is it like where in, I guess, like the hierarchy of reasons people buy a phone do you think it is? I think it's very high. I mean, I think the primary reason people buy phones right now is sadly so that they can feel perpetually connected to the internet. And so I think connectivity, like at, at its most basic level, constant connectivity and social networking mm -hmm. is why people are buying phones. But I think images are a huge part of this. Instagram is the social network that uh, is right now, I think, least hated. Um, and that requires photos. So photos are a, a huge part of the mobile phone experience. Right, um, and I feel like we're seeing people 
walk around with actual cameras less and less because mm -hmm. they're using their phones more and more. I know, I know. Jim isn't here today, right? No. no he's not here. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's I, take another question. Will the XZ2 have slow-mo? Yes. Yeah, so um, Sony, so one of Sony's camera specialties is super slow-mo, and this is because of an innovation that Sony did and then Samsung copied called Motion Eye. What they did is they stacked some memory directly under the, uh, the, the camera sensor so that you can get super slow-mo by being able to transfer data very, very fast from the camera sensor to the memory. And that's, uh, on this device, 960 frames per second at 1080p. Mm -hmm. uh, the Galaxy S9, for instance, does 960 frames per second, but only at 720p. Right. And so super slow-mo is definitely still going to be a differentiator, but that's already on the XC2. And for that matter, it's already on the XC, I believe. that It was introduced with the XC. Super mm -hmm. slow-mo is a, is a big deal for Sony. Um, all right, let's move on to our final news story. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, a bit more serious. Yeah. Um, ZTE was just in the news yesterday, right? Yeah, and this is a, uh, a fast-moving story that is confusing us that I've been discussing on Twitter with a bunch of top analysts, um, where so the headline is that yesterday the U.S. Commerce Department announced that ZTE is going to be banned for, for seven years from uh, buying U.S. components. And so that means that ZTE can't buy any Qualcomm chips, they can't buy any Corning Gorilla Glass, they can't buy any Micron memory. Um, what we are confused about is we don't know whether or not they can use Android um, because the non, we don't know whether using the non-open source parts of Android are considered buying something or not. Mm -hmm. We also don't know whether or not they are allowed to sell things in the U.S. Um, or whether they're only not allowed to buy things from the U.S. But now why is this happening? So this is happening because of a long-running situation between ZTE and the U.S. government, where ZTE is a gigantic Chinese company. And um, China is, the U.S. hates Iran. China does not hate Iran. China, uh, ZTE sold some stuff to Iran in 2012 that turned out to have U.S. components in it. The U.S. got very, very angry. Um, the two companies came to a consent decree where uh, ZTE paid a large fine and dismissed some of their executives. The part of the consent decree was that ZTE would not pay bonuses to 35 particular guys. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that ZTE did pay bonuses to 35 guys. And now, as a result, this ban is coming down and it is going to devastate ZTE's business. And we're talking the number four smartphone player in the US. They have a 10% market share here. Mm -hmm. It could completely destroy their business in the US, all because they insisted on paying bonuses to 35 guys. Like, it seems like this was a case where ZTE was, you know, I don't, I wouldn't even say penny smart and pound foolish. Penny foolish and pound foolish. Right. So, will this affect their business that they do outside of the US? It will, because so much of their business involves having devices with U.S. components. Mm -hmm. CTE was always proud of, uh, of buying Qualcomm chips right. and uh, the quality of Qualcomm's chips. Now they won't be able to buy Qualcomm chips anymore. Uh, they'll have to buy MediaTek instead. Um, and it could really hurt some of these U.S. companies, especially if this starts, uh, if this starts basically tit-for-tat actions uh, from China. A uh, half of Qualcomm sales are in China. If China starts clamping down on Qualcomm, mm -hmm. that really hurts them. Same thing with, once again, Corning, with uh, Microsoft, Intel, um, Google, um, uh, Micron, all of these companies that supply components to Chinese manufacturers. Um, if, the, if, the, if the trade lines start really freezing up, uh, this could be bad for everybody. Right, and I, I feel like ZTE is not necessarily the most popular name in the U.S., but they make some of our favorite unlocked phones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they and 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 they make good. Uh, they make some good prepaid phones. Mm -hmm. uh, ZTE is just known for affordable, reasonably high quality prepaid devices. Right. Um, they have they have some fans in the U.S., um, but this is all because I mean, seriously, this is this this could be a minor apocalypse caused by ZTE's insistence on paying bonuses to 35 random guys. It's, 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 a, it's an incredible miscalculation on their part. Right. Um, any other questions out there? 
All right, well, on that very uh, hopeful note, um, so uh, just one, actually one last thing. So during the show, we usually ask you if you have any questions. Uh, yes. But if you do have any other questions, uh, leave them in the comments. We will read those. We might write articles based on those. I mean, I know that we can give you some quick advice on the air, but we can also write much longer, useful articles that uh, would be helpful to about things people. like about things like voice quality. Yeah, seriously, I'm I am personally I'll appeal to you folks. I'm personally looking for how-to ideas right now. So um, if you have questions about how to do something with your phone, uh, put it in the comments. We will read it. Uh, put in the Facebook comments because I don't read YouTube comments because they're bad for your health. <laughs> but uh, put in the Facebook comments. And uh, we will read it, and we, we might write stories based on them. Yeah. And thanks again for watching, and we will see you again soon. Mm -hmm.